and the mission was the you know first flight of the lunar module to the moon, and uh, to go there. And we, unfortunately, we were too heavy to, to try a landing. But we had, also the software hadn't been worked out for the power descent for the lunar module. So our job was to go there, do everything to simulate the whole mission down to about nine miles above the moon and, and radar map, photo map, visually look at it and pick out a potential ellipse for the first lunar landing site and work out all the procedures. The launch itself, you had the vibration noise, but it didn't feel too much more than the, the uh, really the Titan II going up. And it was, it was slow, it took us 11 seconds just to clear the tower. We're moving so slow. Of course, there's six and a quarter million pounds, and it was 363 feet tall. Well, the, it turns out the lift offs were nearly the same, but later on it got a little different. Now, the lift off, you can barely feel lift off because you notice how slow that booster moves. You feel pressure on your back, but then as the fuel burns out of the tanks and you go to a higher altitude, the air gets thinner. The, engine produces more thrust, you get more and more G's, but the liftoff is, is, is nearly the same now. The shut, I didn't fly that, but it helped design it. That's a solid rocket motor. You have, you can feel more, I've been through simulations, feel more lift on it, but liftoff was, was very, very nominal. But it, in, in the real hot rod, was that Titan that you see over in the museum. The big giant Saturn I flew to the moon, it took 11 seconds to clear the tower. And I never pulled over. We shut down the center engine after about a minute and a half, but, uh, you know, to reduce the G-load. But we, I never got over four Gs going out. And it's, the G-force is coming in this way. You're laying on your back, feet up. And uh, so it was 11 minutes on the big three-stage Saturn. It was 10 minutes on the small side, and I did Apollo Soyuz. And that was again about four Gs, and then three and a half on the second stage. On that Gemini Titan, and that was 10 minutes. So 11 minutes, 10 minutes. In the Gemini Titan, you were in orbit in five minutes and 35 seconds. And that made me really move. You're up to six Gs at the end of the first stage. And you notice these hollow, you go there, look at the second stage, you'll see these openings in the, where the skin is. That's by design. They fire the second stage before the bolts blew to disconnect by a few milliseconds. And that was to be sure that warhead kept going. And uh, so there was a big, it, it fired down on the dome of the second, first stage tank, and a big fireball engulfed it and wham, you went right through the fireball, left a little film on the windows. And it was real quiet. The second stage, you couldn't hardly feel, hear the, or feel the engine running. You knew there's something going on back there, but then it kept building up 5Gs, 6Gs, 7Gs, 8Gs. At the end, you went from 8Gs to 0G like that in a tenth of a second. That was a heck of a ride, I'll tell you. After the third stage, of the Saturn burned out, and we had a big vibration, we found out, due to the fact that in the tank pressurization was set too close to the vent valve, and it got into a harmonic vibration that fed into the engine that was shaking us like that. And it kept building up. I thought the thing was going to fly apart, and then finally it shut out. It was in six tenths of a foot per second of what was targeted. Fantastic. But then the third stage maneuvered over to a position where the sun would be over my shoulder and look down at the lunar module, the top of the lunar module, come in to dock. So we came in, we docked, hooked up. It took us about, oh, to get everything, we had to pressurize the tunnel, pressurize the lunar module, which was a vacuum, and uh, hook up the electrical cables to provide power down into the lunar module and do all this. Uh, it was nearly two hours before, after TLI, you know, that we finally pulled back on the maneuver handle 
and went over to set up this barbecue mode because you don't fly to the moon, you barbecue to the moon because you have the sun out here. And if you sit in one position, it would heat up one side of the spacecraft, very hot. And it could explode the tanks, the other side would radiate to deep space. And it could freeze the fuel and the bowels and everything. So we rotated one revolution every 20 minutes. But you could stop for a couple hours with all the super insulation we had on and make, make for John with his telescope to make a star sighting and then head on. But uh, we hadn't seen the Earth. Look at, that, look at the Earth, look at the Earth. Oh, gee, look at the Earth, John. Oh my God, can't believe it. It's just... John, we just had Earth rise, fantastic. When, when CERN saw it first, my God, and when I saw it, man, I hardly believe it. It was, oh, about one and a half times as big as a basketball. It was just slowly shrinking away. So, wow, I'm going for a long ride today. Only towards maybe the end of the mission around the moon, by then the Earth looked like the size of an orange. And then, Maybe, and then by then it was just half an orange. It was half it was eclipsed. So uh, I said, how can you have all those problems back there? At that time, there was four and a half billion people on the earth. I says, how can you have all those problems and issues back there? And so uh, there's that also, another thing, you know, somebody had to put this whole thing together. Here the earth was, really, it was kind of a fun a feeling that you see the earth just suspended out there. You think there should be a string holding it up or should be on a pencil? So, so about this big something should be holding it up. There it was. And had it on live color TV. And I was the one that insisted and pushed and had set up a little program to get color TV on Apollo 10. They had a program in NASA to do it in about three years. I said, we, space is so beautiful the way you look down at the Earth, Earth orbit, the two missions I'd had before. I said, we gotta do better than just black and white. And so we got it done in about four months. Put it on board a week before launch. On the way, we, we were brief, said the moon is gonna be eclipsed most of the way out there, you won't see it. I remember John Young said, about a day and a half out, said, hey, we're way out here and we still don't see the moon but we'll take your guy's word that's out there. And finally, when we got maybe 50 minutes out, John was down there with his 28 power telescope, said, hey guys, come here. He looked and here was just a little thin crisp of the moon. And then it disappeared. And so we kept going and after a while, the sun disappeared, black. And here's all the sky and the stars. Well, in fact, on the way out, the reflection of the Earth is so much. We didn't see any stars with the naked eye until we were about 90,000 miles out. And we could see Cirrus, Canopus, some of the bright stars. Then the further we got, the more stars you could see, but nothing like nighttime. And then finally, when the sun went down, boom, it was just like around the Earth at nighttime. Except we noticed there was a big kind of black area of space. There was no stars. So that had to be the moon. And after a while, the earth disappeared. There we were, just out in blackness. No sun, no earth. Just a big kind of a black area in space. So we got in the right attitude. What was amazing, only 60 seconds, right one minute before we were to turn on the engine to burn into lunar orbit, suddenly, whoom, here came the moon right underneath us, 60 miles. Everybody's looking around and saying, hey guys, you gotta get your head back in the cockpit. We gotta make this burn. I guess the one thing that impressed me so much besides these huge craters, these boulders, I said they're as big as a two or three story building. Just look kind of look. Oh, here's one that tossed boulders out of it. You got it? Yep. It tossed boulders right out of the stuff. Look at that mother. See it? Right there. You can see yep. it. Yep. Yep. This little one right here tossed boulders right out of the front of the gun. There's still a bunch in there. Well, what we had to do is get behind John Young so he could come back. Just Charlie Brown. We were Snoopy to do a, a rendezvous. So we 
made a maneuver that went took us up 215 miles above, which slowed us down, and then down to about nine miles. And we kept doing this. So he got further away. And then we started down, and it went in the nighttime. Oh, that's when we heard these, this weird noise for about 40 seconds, I guess. I heard this noise, and it was kind of like, ooh, ooh. I heard that. I look over at Cern and I could see he's, I says, Gino, do you hear what I hear? He says, yeah, Tom, what, what is it? He says, I don't know. And it slowly went away. John Young never heard the noise. So it was probably some RFI in our system. But we never saw any aliens. But so then as we came down, we broke out in the daylight coming down, lower and lower. And um, so, you know, things get more definition, just like they do in an airplane when you get lower. You can see more and more. A building that looks like that, as you get lower, it gets bigger. Same way with the craters and boulders. One thing that amazed me was the boulders. Like, gosh, they were big. Now, originally, I just thought just a glance, they were as big as a three or four story building. Well, shoot, they're as big as a Georgia dome. They were bigger. They were just gigantic. They were up on the rim of the crater. Some were down at the bottom of these craters. So obviously the same thing happened to the Earth billions of years ago, but we have an atmosphere, and uh, they were, uh, you know, eroded by water and wind over the billions of years, and now you don't see it anymore. Maybe the only one in the Earth that popped still up is this Ayers Rock down in Australia. Well, th then we staged the vehicle. Fired the acid stage, checked that out, and brought the, the high point, which is called Apolloon, brought that down. So we'd be into a start to, to work towards the co-elliptic orbit, and, uh, and then do the standard phasing that we'd have and perform the first rendezvous around the moon. We used the same height, the 15 miles, so this would, that we did around the Earth. So, and, uh, what we had you know, to work out, so it worked out great. Right, well, we set the all-time world speed record. We came back from the moon in 42 hours, less than two days. Now, going out to the moon, most of the vehicles went out in 76, 78, 80 hours at the most. But coming back, those last three missions, Apollo 15, 16, and 17, that had the lunar rover, and they were, had a lot heavier lunar module, but they'd stretch the tanks on the descent stage to give it more fuel and all this, so they could, they took more fuel for the command and service module to burn into orbit. So they had less to come back. So they came back in 110, 120 hours. We came back in 42. So just as we hit the atmosphere, because your velocity's picking up all the time as you come into the Earth, you know, the distance squared, <laughs> of course, who you get, the faster you go. And uh, the, uh, I think it was, uh, it was at nighttime. And uh, we, we also turned on the secondary coolant loop and the primary. We turned it full cold, uh, about six hours out. So by the time we hit the atmosphere, we were, had goose pimples and there was frost all over the spacecraft. It was just like you saw in Apollo, Apollo 13 movie. And then as you pull it, your, your, your back, the G-force is coming this way. So as it starts to heat up, that frost turns and drops, so it starts to rain on you a little bit. And we were still cold right in the middle of the fireball all the way down. We didn't start to really get, to get warm in there until we were on the parachutes and then we hit the water. You know, the, the great author uh, said, Arthur C. Clarke, one of the great science writers of, uh, in modern era, said that a thousand years from now, when historians look back on the 20th century, they will note that yes, there were two major wars among the developed countries in the Northern Hemisphere, but the one thing they will be noticed most of all will be the Apollo program, where for the first time in history, men went to the moon, walked on the moon, 
came back. He says, Apollo really was the, the high point of the 20th century. And I think he's right. Now, what it did to this country, it really uh, pushed our technology, like Kennedy wanted technology, and all the way from alloys, computer science, uh, safety procedures, and processes. So it just moved us way up technically. In fact, we're still living on some of those things that Apollo did. But also there's a big emphasis in all the university school on science and math and physics. You know, I've had over the years more people come to me said, seeing you as a little boy or a little girl on TV, I said, gee, I want to do that, but I want I knew I had to study hard, so that's why I went to the university or college and did that. So I've had many people say this really affected Apollo. Gemini and Apollo really affected their lives.